Hello, and thank you for listening to today's episode of JTCast, the official podcast of the Journal of Athletic Training. I'm your host, Luke Donovan. For the second episode of the month, I will discuss the findings of an article from the most recent issue of JT titled Clinical Management of Patellar Tendinopathy, authored by Dr. Adam Rosen and colleagues from the University of Nebraska at Omaha and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. As a reminder, the article discussed today can be found on the JAT website, natajournals.org. And please remember that all content from JAT is open access to all readers, thanks to the funding from the National Athletic Trainers Association. Let's survey the scene. Patellar tendinopathy is one of the most common knee injuries. Over the years, terms such as jumper's knee, patellar tendinitis, and patellar tendinosis have been used to describe chronic pain to either or both the patellar or quadriceps tendons. In reality, the term jumper's knee provides a false depiction of the injury, as the name alludes that only individuals participating in jumping sports develop the injury. In reality, any individuals who participate in activities that cause loading of the patellar tendon through rapid change in speed, frequent change in direction, repetitive movements, or any combination of these are at risk for developing patellar tendon symptoms. Histopathological examinations also indicate that a clinical diagnosis of tendinitis implying acute inflammation or tendinosis implying degeneration of the tendon tissue are often incorrect. As such, without a tissue biopsy, it is recommended that clinicians should use the umbrella term tendinopathy to describe tissue that has failed to heal due to being overloaded without adequate recovery. Nonetheless, the poor understanding of the underlying pathology contributing to patellar tendinopathy limits our ability to provide effective treatment. Therefore, the purpose of this current clinical concepts article was to present practicing clinicians with the best available evidence pertaining to the pathophysiology, evaluation, and treatment of patients with patellar tendinopathy. Starting with the pathophysiology of patellar tendinopathy, although the evidence can be conflicting, much suggests chronic degeneration of the tendon rather than acute inflammatory response. The tendon often demonstrates higher concentrations of type 3 collagen as opposed to type 1, which is the dominant collagen within a healthy tendon. Furthermore, the collagen fibers of a pathologic tendon appear to be thinner and less organized. The structural changes to the tendon are likely a result of mechanical overloading of the quadriceps muscles with the absence of adequate recovery. In response, the tendon begins to weaken in response to the excessive submaximal tensile strain placed on the tendon. Certain risk factors have been identified that may expedite this process. A primary risk factor is participation in activities that repetitively load the patellar tendon coupled with training behavior. Patients with patellar tendinopathy demonstrate significantly higher training volumes, previous training volumes, and match exposures when compared to individuals without the injury. Aside from behavioral factors, a recent meta-analysis found that higher body weight was associated with patellar tendinopathy, and despite common speculation, the type of playing surface was not related to the development of the injury. Other studies have observed differences in muscle strength, static alignment, and range of motion when comparing individuals with and without patellar tendinopathy, or found a relationship between these measures and the level of self-reported disability. Some examples of these clinical measures are decreased quadriceps and hamstring strength and flexibility, decreased dorsiflexion range of motion, increased pelvic tilt, and increased static genuvalgum alignment. Biomechanically, decreased sagittal plane motion of the hip and the knee during movement has also been associated with the development and continuances of the injury. Patients with the condition typically present with insidious pain localized to the anterior knee over the patellar tendon. Early on, the pain may be present during the start of activity and begin to diminish as the activity continues. As the condition advances, pain may continue through the activity. Outside of physical activity, it is not uncommon for patients to report pain during activities of daily living, such as climbing and descending stairs and sitting for long periods of time. The diagnosis of patellar tendinopathy is most commonly completed through physical examination. Upon exam, palpation has been found to be statistically reliable for detecting pain. Pain mapping, where a patient is provided an image to pinpoint the pain location, especially during a loading task such as a single limb squat, greatly improves the accuracy of the clinical assessment. Various hopping tests, such as the single limb hop for distance and the six meter hop test may be useful when tracking function and performance over time.
The main differential diagnosis of patellar tendinopathy is patellofemoral pain syndrome. It is important to note that these conditions can coexist, but can be differentiated from one another with the palpation techniques and knee loading activities previously described. Although clinical assessment is typically the most appropriate method to diagnose the condition, imaging may be used to confirm to assess whether other conditions coexist. Plain film radiographs, diagnostic ultrasound, and magnetic resonance imaging can help assess the integrity of patellar tendon and surrounding structures. Aside from the physical examination and potential imaging, patient-reported outcome measures are also a valuable component of the assessment. Questionnaires such as the Victorian Institute of Sport Assessment Patella have demonstrated the ability to differentiate individuals with and without the condition. Considering the potential long duration of symptoms, which averages 19 months, having an in-depth assessment of patient perceived function and disability can help guide clinical management. As such, the International Scientific Tendinopathy Symposium Consensus developed core domains for patellar tendinopathy. The nine domains and specific ways to assess the domains in patients with patellar tendinopathy include 1. Patient rating of condition, measured using a global rating from 0% to 100% of the patient's feeling about patellar tendinopathy status. 2. Activity participation, measured using the Tegner Activity Scale or Activities of Daily Living Scale. 3. Pain during activity and or loading, which can be measured using a 100 millimeter visual analog scale immediately after completing a single limb squat. 4. Patient function, examples being either the lower extremity functional scale or the Lysholm knee scale. 5. Psychological factors, measured by the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia. 6. Physical function capacity, assessed by measuring quadriceps strength, quadriceps flexibility, and completing the single limb hop for distance in 6 meter hop tests. 7. Disability, measured using the Victorian Institute of Sport Assessment Patellar Questionnaire or the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center Patellar Tendinopathies Questionnaire. 8. Health-related quality of life, using the Short Form Survey 36. And 9. Pain over a specific time, measured using a 100 millimeter visual analog scale for pain. Now that we've provided an overview of the assessment, let's talk about clinical management. Patellar tendinopathy rehabilitation can be lengthy, which can often be tiring for both patients and clinicians. Again, an in-depth assessment can aid with developing an organized and patient-centered treatment program. Conservative treatment is recommended where surgery should only be considered for patients with severe symptoms that reduce function and quality of life and only after conservative treatment has failed. The rehabilitation process can be broken into four phases, which are symptom management and load reduction, recovery, and return to unrestricted sport participation. The progression across these phases are dependent on severity, compliance, pain, and duration of symptoms. Let's work through the provided example depicted in Table 2. I want to acknowledge that the time frames may differ between patients and that the table is meant to provide a rehabilitation framework that can be tailored to align with an individual's characteristic of that of your patient. For symptom and load management, where this phase may last four weeks, studies have shown that complete rest and passive modalities are inferior to exercise in progressive loading regimens. Therefore, finding the balance between reducing tendon stress and optimizing loading is key. Initially, the volume and frequency of activities should be reduced to being below 25% of normal volume. Appropriate load can be monitored and progressed using a pain monitoring model. Most pain monitoring models rely on visual analog scales where a threshold of acceptable pain is identified. In this case, a 5 out of 10 is considered acceptable, where if a patient reports a 5 out of 10 at the end of an activity, they may resume training the following day as long as the tendon pain is reduced to being below a 5. Other activities that can be completed in this first phase include replacing jumping, squatting activities with aquatic therapy, completing isometric quadricep activation exercises, completing Spanish squats, completing quadricep stretching, and including some modalities such as noxious tens and low-powered laser, as well as ionophoresis.
Going into our second phase, the recovery phase, which typically spans between week two and week six, the pain threshold should remain below a 5 out of 10 on a pain visual analog scale, but sport participation can begin to increase up to about 50% of normal volume. In addition, patients can begin integrating submaximal jumping and squatting into their exercise routine. Specific exercise progression may include concentric double limb knee extensions, 25 degree decline double limb squats, and a continued quadricep stretching program. Patients may also benefit from patellar tendon strapping during activity. For our third phase, typically between 4 and 12 weeks, patients will begin to start the rebuilding phase. During this phase, the acceptable pain threshold is now reduced to 3 out of 10, and sport participation volume is progressed up to 75% of normal training. Patients can now begin working toward maximal jumping and moderate plyometric training. Patients may continue the 25-degree decline squats and begin introducing additional exercises such as squats, leg press, and hack squats. A pain monitoring model should be implemented during these types of exercises. Quadriceps flexibility and patellar tendon strapping should also be continued to use. The final phase, which typically begins approximately 12 weeks after, should include unrestricted sport participation. With that being said, pain monitoring with a threshold of 1 out of 10 should continue to be implemented. In addition, the 25-degree decline squats, traditional squats, leg press, and hat squats should be continued and progress to great loads as strength continues to increase. Finally, quadricep stretching should also continue to be implemented. In summary, patellar tendinopathy is a complex condition that requires a systematic and multifaceted approach to ensure patient recovery. A comprehensive evaluation may aid with developing a patient-centered rehabilitation program. Well, that's it for today's JT Cast. Please remember to rate and subscribe to the podcast, which is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and Stitcher. You can find out more information about upcoming podcasts and other JAT events on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts at JAT underscore NATA. Thank you for listening and keep a lookout for next month's JAT Cast episode. Mm-hmm.